All right, this PowerPoint presentation will correlate with chapter six in the Explorations textbook or chapter seven in the Essentials textbook. This PowerPoint will focus on primate behavior, reproduction, and dominance hierarchies. Let's talk a little bit about primate societies. As we learned in the last chapter, one of the defining characteristics of a primate is that they live in social groups and they have various social signals that will establish and maintain those social relationships and alliances. I have several video clips for you guys to watch in the module. They're looking at uh, identifying some of these social signals. Primate societies are highly organized. They tend to form long-term social relationships and alliances. Social behaviors in primates are thought to enhance survival and reproduction and are likely maintained through the process of natural selection. So essentially being social and forming alliances provides primates individual and increased individual fitness and increased reproductive success. Therefore, those that have strong social signals and strong ability to form alliances are going to be more likely to survive and more likely to reproduce. All right, let's talk about primate residence patterns. So residence patterns are talking about how primate societies organize themselves, how many adult males, how many adult females, juveniles, and also delves into their reproductive strategies. So primates, a very diverse order, they have a wide variety of residence patterns and mating strategies. They're divided according to the number of adult males and females present in the group, and it is related to their reproductive strategies. So some of the reproductive strategies we will explore, um, polygonous. So polygonous societies are consisting of one dominant male and many females. That one dominant male will then mate with all of the reproductively receptive females in that group. Uh, polyandrous, polyandrous societies would be one female and multi-male. Monogamous is one of the most rare forms. It's one male and one female. This is really only seen in some of the Strepsirhines and Gibbons and Siamings, and of course some humans. So in general, primate residence patterns can range anywhere from a solitary individual all the way up to troops of hundreds of primates. Uh, but again, the solitary structure is very rare. That's only really seen in orangutans. All right, so this chart here is going to show you um, the various forms of residence patterns and also it's, it, that will correlate with the reproductive strategy. So the first one here, um, the red is representing the females and the blue is representing the males. So this is the one male multi-female. So you see this in gelata and hamadryas baboons, also in gorillas. So that one dominant male or the harem master is then going to mate with all of the females in that group. So that's a polygonous mating strategy. So typically alongside these harem groups also exists what we call the bachelors or the all male group. So the bachelors exist kind of on the periphery or on the outskirts of these one male multi-female groups. And the bachelor's goal is to essentially take over the harem master. Um, and then we will watch a video on this module on baboons that will look at both of these structures and how they work together. Uh, number two is the one female multi-male. So it's the one dominant female and the males in the group. That female is mating with all the males in the group in a polyandrous mating structure. So we see this in some strepsirhines and some platyrines. Multi-male, multi-female. So this is multiple males of reproductive age and multiple females of reproductive age and their offspring. Uh, they tend to practice a poly polygynous uh, mating strategy so the dominant males have increased access to mating with the dominant with the females. Uh, the all male, the bachelors that exists alongside the one male multi-female groupings. Number five, the one male, one female, the monogamous mating strategy that's seen in some strepsirhines and uh, gibbons and siamangs, the lesser apes. And then the solitary strategy is really only seen in orangutans. So typically what happens is the male will mate with all of the females that are within his range. So even though it's a, um, a solitary grouping, the male is still practicing polygyny, meaning that he's mating with multiple females that are in his reproductive range. All right, dispersal patterns. So this is talking about how primates will disperse or migrate once they reach reproductive maturity. In primate society, either the males or the females will disperse from their natal group. The natal group is the group that they were born into. So either the males or the females will disperse at the time of sexual maturity. 
So just like it sounds, female dispersal means that once the females hit sexual maturity, they will then migrate or disperse to another group that's not their natal group. And then male dispersal, we see a lot of this in the bachelor groups and the, the uh, one male multi-female groups. So that means once the males reach sexual maturity, they will then disperse or migrate to another group. Um, so this dispersal pattern is essentially a reproductive strategy to avoid breeding with individuals that are too closely related, also known as inbreeding. And dispersal will also serve to reduce competition amongst males. Um, especially in those groups that are highly competitive for access to females, like the one male multi-female groups and also the multi-male multi-female groups. Um, once the males start reaching sexual maturity, they could potentially come into direct conflict with the dominant male of the group. So dispersal prevents inbreeding as well as reducing competition and violence amongst primate society. All right, reproductive strategies. We touched on this a little bit in the last chapter, but we learned about sexual dimorphism and how that can sometimes predict the level of competition in a group. So in general, males are going to compete for access to females, to reproductive mates. So this will affect overall male body size and canine size. So if you're looking at uh, this group of gelata baboons, for example, you see that the males are much larger than the females. And they also have what we call sexually dimorphic canines. So they have much larger, more projecting canines than the females do. So if you see high levels of sexual dimorphism, then you know that that primate society likely has very high levels of competition for access to mates. Um, the greater the competition for females, the greater level of sexual, sexual dimorphism in both body size and canine size. And then in general, female primates will compete for access to resources. Um, so that might be food, to, to support both their own caloric demands as well as the caloric demands of their infants, of their developing children. Um, they also cooperate with one another. Female primates tend to cooperate in child rearing and also obtaining adequate food sources to support themselves and their offspring. All right, dominance hierarchy. So that term dominance hierarchies, it often makes you think of violence, but actually dominance hierarchies generally serve to reduce the amount of violence within a primate group. Low-ranking individuals do not typically attack or threaten high-ranking individuals within the group. They tend to essentially accept their place on the totem pole. High-ranking individuals often display their dominance through various gestures and displays. In one of the film clips we're going to watch, you'll see how the baboons will oftentimes flip their lips up to expose their sexually dimorphic canines, as you're seeing here in the gelata. Um, they oftentimes also stand bipedally to expose this red region here, sometimes called the bleeding heart. They sometimes stand bipedally to display, display their size and their hair sometimes kind of sticks on end, as you see here in this picture. They also do something called lid flashing or eyelid flashing, and that's another way of displaying their dominance. Um, high ranking individuals display their dominance in most primate societies. Uh, rankings can be somewhat fluid and might change. So the benefit of being a high-ranking individual, a high-ranking primate, is high-ranking individuals are often afforded increased access to both resources and increased access to mates. So that would equal higher reproductive success. So high-ranking females tend to have more surviving offspring. Daughters of high-ranking females tend to mature faster. High-ranking females tend to have decreased birth intervals. So all of that can be related to increased access to resources. If they have increased access to food and protection and territory, then they're going to be more likely to be successful in not only their own survival, but also supporting the survival of their offspring. And decreased birth intervals is talking about the period of time between each birth, between birth A, birth B, birth C, so on and so forth. So if you decrease those intervals, it means that that female will likely have more offspring in her lifetime. And mother's ranking usually determines the ranking of the offspring, especially in chimpanzee society. All right, infanticide. Infanticide is not um, super common. It's, it does happen amongst primates. It's, it's a lot more common in certain species. It has been observed among red colobus monkeys, various species of savanna baboons like Hamadryas and gelata baboons orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, and of course humans. So the most common time it occurs is when a male from one of the bachelor groups takes over one of those one male multi-female groups. And the reason for that, it's believed or hypothesized to be a strategy to increase the reproductive fitness of that incoming bachelor, incoming male. 
um, because the theory is, you know, if, if that bachelor takes over a new group and the majority of the females in that group are already with infants and practicing on-demand breastfeeding, they're not going to enter into estrus until they complete that process. So it's a strategy by that male to ensure that those females enter into estrus and become receptive to mating as soon as possible. So as brutal as that sounds, that's really hypothesized to be one of the primary reasons for male infanticide, for a male to kill an infant. Um, concealed ovulation amongst females may have evolved as a reproductive strategy to prevent infanticide. So essentially, if a female has concealed ovulation, if it's not certain when she's ovulating, then it confuses paternity. And if that male is not certain if that offspring could be his, he's less likely to, to commit infanticide. All right, so these are the two links to the clips I would like you guys to watch on Gelada Baboons. These links are also in the module itself, um, so you don't need to click on it from the PowerPoint. You can just go to them in the module. And I want you to keep an eye out for some, for some key elements. I want you to look out for sexual dimorphism. Notice how much larger the males are than the females. And notice um, they're projecting canines, how the males have much larger canines than the females. I want you to notice the various social signals that they utilize to establish dominance. So look for the lip flaring, the eyelid flashing, the standing bipedally to expose the red chest, the bleeding heart. And I want you to also look for, out for how the females are involved. So even though the males in this particular reproductive strategy, even though the males are relatively dominant, the females are still very important in the structure of the dominance hierarchy. If the gelata male, if the harem master loses the support of the females in the group, it's going to be much more likely that one of those bachelors can then take it over. So keep an eye out for those three things. Look for sexual dimorphism, try to identify the social signals, and also recognize how the females are involved in the overall dominant strategies of the males. All right, so primates, of course, are not just competitive. They're also cooperative, cooperative with one another. Um, you see behaviors, various forms of altruistic behaviors. So altruistic behaviors are providing a benefit to the donee, not necessarily the donor. So it's behaviors that are helping out a friend. So kind of I scratch your back, you scratch my back kind of idea. So some examples of this predator alarm calls. So if you envision for a moment that we're all a group of vervet monkeys and one of us lets out the alarm call that signals an aerial predator, predator like a hawk or an eagle, then all of a sudden the entire group knows to move down in the canopy to hopefully avoid that aerial predator. But the primate that's setting out that alarm call is essentially putting him or herself in danger because obviously letting out that sound is calling attention to that primate and allowing his or her group mates to avoid being eaten by that predator. Um, grooming also cements social bonding. So oftentimes you'll see primates spending lots of time grooming one another. It's forming and cementing their alliances with one another. Because uh, as social as social animals, they need each other. They can't be just, you know, a lone wolf. They need others in their group to help them survive. Food sharing. So you see this a lot with meat sharing among chimpanzees. I have some video clips for you guys on this. Uh, but typically it's the dominant males that tend to be the most successful hunters. And they then determine who they share that very high quality protein source with. Caregiving is something we often see even in female primates and even adolescent female primates. Um, pr female primates not only care for their own young, but they oftentimes help care for the young of those that they form alliances with or their friends. Um, grooming behaviors in a wide variety of contexts, like I mentioned, it reinforces social bonding and make those, makes those alliances much stronger. So you'll see grooming between mother and infants, between subordinates and dominants between males and sexually reproductive females, uh, between females and females, males and males. It's a very common altruistic behavior amongst primates. All right, so altruistic behaviors are believed to be part of kin selection. So kin, think camp, think about family when you think about kin. So kin selection would be behaviors related to living with relatives who share genetic material. So you see a lot of um, kin selection in baboons and chimpanzees, and of course in humans. Uh, the best way I can explain it is think back to when you were in middle school or even high school, if you went to school with a sibling or possibly even a cousin, um, you may have possibly given your sibling a little bit of a hard time and teased him or her 
but the second somebody else does it, you get that instinct to protect them that, you know, it's okay if I tease my sibling, but, you know, if somebody else tries to do it, that's not a family member, all of a sudden you go into that protective mode. So you have this hardwired instinct to protect those that you are related to. All right, let's go ahead and pause there and then we will pick this up in part two of this presentation.